Today we continue studying Parshas Acharimot. We come to the end of the Torah's narrative of Yom Kippur. In yesterday's class, in our presentation, we discussed the notion that the Yom Kippur rites were communicated to Aaron at a specific time. It's the name of the Parsha. Acharei Mot Shnei Bnei Aharon. After the passing of Aaron's children. And yesterday we learned that this was because Aaron's children were filled with a deep-seated desire to cling to God in the most intimate of ways. And propelled forward with this passion and this fervor, they rushed the Holy of Holies, if you will, and became swept up in holy fervor and fire. And the bodies and souls simply could no longer remain together as their spirit became reabsorbed into its source. So Moshe Rabbeinu is told to tell Aaron that entrance into the Holy of Holies, penetrating the sacred scrimmage of the inner sanctum of the Beit HaMikdash is something that can be done, but only by a Kohen Gadol and only under very specific controlled circumstances. It's a Yom Kippur thing. Moshe Rabbeinu then proceeds to tell Aaron about the various rights and responsibilities of a high priest, the person representing the entire nation of Israel on this holiest day of the year. One reading flows into the next. And today in our conjoined parashiot, we start reading what would typically be the third aliyah in a parashat Acharimot. And at the end of the Torah's narrative, of Yom HaKippurim, which also includes the notion of us fasting, the various abstentions that punctuate this day. And we talk about the fact that this is not only about Aaron, but about future Kohanim Gdolim high priests who will occupy his position. The Torah, at the end of the third reading, in the year when Acharimot is read on its own, or this year, in the midst of the second reading, chapter 17, verse 34. The Torah says, V'hayta zot lachem l'chukat olam. This will be for you as an eternal rule. L'chaper al b'nei Yisrael. In order for you to effect atonement upon the Israelites, the children of Israel. Mikol chatotam for all of their sins. Achat bashana. This annual event, just once a year. And then the Torah concludes with six very curious words. It concludes the Yom Kippur narrative, the communication of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, bringing the message of God to his illustrious older brother who serves as the high priest. The Torah says, and I quote, Vaya'as ka'asher tziva Hashem et Moshe. Aaron did exactly as God had commanded Moses. Kind of strange. It's kind of strange because would it not be implicit that Aaron would do exactly as God had commanded through Moses? In any way, when did he do this? When he received the commandment? In yesterday's presentation, we established the notion that this had to have taken place on Rosh Chodesh Nisan or somewhere very close to it. So when did Aaron do these things? Rashi says, Vayas ka'asher tziva Hashem, elucidating the notion that Aaron had performed exactly what he was told to do, fulfilling the instructions that God gave to him through Moshe Rabbeinu, it doesn't mean that he did it immediately. Some six months later, when Yom Kippur arrived, also that's when he went through these motions. In other words, Aaron didn't do this right away. He did it six months later. 
And then Rashi goes on to say, This verse broadcasts the praiseworthiness, the virtues as they were of Aaron. Aaron did not wear these articles of clothing, these resplendent and beautiful white garments that were made especially for Yom Kippur. Think of a, a bridal gown on that level. Aaron didn't wear this for his own pleasure. Ela, Rashi says, only He was simply fulfilling the decree the instruction, the edict of the king. Now, really what Rashi is doing here is twofold. Number one, he's telling us that the meaning of vayas, that the notion of Aaron doing, is to be taken literally. Yes, Aaron did exactly as God had commanded him, but he couldn't do it right away. This, this had to take place in its appropriate time. That's the whole point of this communication where Moses is telling Aaron, you can't rush the Holy of Holies. You can't get inspired and filled with passion and fervor and do as you please. You gotta follow the rules. There's a system, there's an order here. The Deva points out that there are other occasions where we hear about things being done which are not to be taken in a literal level. One perhaps most famous example is in the parsha called Bo. The book of Exodus, chapter 12, Moses gives a whole slew of instructions to the nascent nation that he is about to take out of Egypt. And it says, the nation, when they're hearing these words and the promises, bowed and prostrated themselves. In the very next verse, in chapter 12, 28, it says, Vayel Chuvayasu, the Israelites went and did so. And Rashi says, what do you mean? They went and did so. This is on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. They have to do so on the 10th day of Nisan. And later on, the 14th. Yeah, Rashi says. It doesn't mean. It means, it means Kiblu Aleim. Because they resolved immediately to fulfill all of the instructions that they got through Moses in its proper time, God considers it as if they went and did it. So you could read this verse and say, oh, Bayas Aaron, and Aaron did all the things that he was commanded to do. He resolved to do those things. Rashi says, no, no. This time it's not about resolutions. This time we want you to know he actually did it. Uh, when did he do it? The whole idea is that this is an achat bashana, a once a year opportunity. And the answer is, he did it when he was supposed to. He did it on Yom Kippur. Okay, so now we know what the verse is saying. The verse could have been saying Aaron resolved to do it. Rashi is telling us not so. Here we want to emphasize what Aaron actually did. But then there's another question here. And the other question is why is this relevant? What is the Torah trying to say to us? Ah, here Rashi says that there is actually a very important message that's being conveyed to us. The message is that when Aaron did do what he was supposed to do, what he did do, what he was instructed to do, despite the fact that this was something that he yearned for, Aaron was hardwired to experience an intimate moment with God. And that's the meaning of going into the Holy of Holies. Aaron was predisposed to having such a yearning, such a thirst and a desire to cling to God that he could have entered the Holy of Holies and never left. That's what happened to his children. So Aaron is waiting for six months to see the fulfillment of this precise and exact thing he yearned for. But when he did it, Rashi says, he didn't do it because he was on a spiritual trip. He did it because God told him to do it. And it's really interesting that Rashi chooses to emphasize the garments. The truth is that we have this notion, this idea, that sometimes, you'll forgive me for using a pun, clothes do make the man, sometimes. Our sages tell us, Bizman she bigdehem alehem, kuhunatam alehem. When the Kohen is wearing Kohanic raiments, then 
his Cohen potential can be realized. That is to say, if you're not a Kohen, you have no business in the Beit HaMikdash. And that which you will perform there will be meaningless and non-effective. So you need to be a Kohen. But you need to be more than just a Kohen. You need to have more than just the genetics and the right birth. You need to actually be wearing the right clothing. Because only when the Kohen is wearing the right clothing, only then does his Kohanic potential come to the fore. Only then does his Kohanic ability to connect to God in the most marvelous of ways, to serve as a conduit between God and, and all of us, only then is it realized. And here's the point. Here's the point. The Nebuchadnezzar says, the white clothes, the bridal clothes, how about the golden clothes? Surely they were much more magnificent. A gem-studded breastplate? Beautiful onyx epaulets, bells ringing, beautiful fabric weaving. <laughs> it's you telling me that the white clothes he didn't wear for his own glorious spiritual trip? Well, here's the thing. The Kohen Gadol did indeed wear very special clothing. They're called Big Day Kahuna, Gedola, the Big Kahuna's clothes. Lots of bling, a lot of gold, a lot of very, very beautiful and remarkable details. But the thing also is that it wasn't necessarily made for this Kohen Gadol. Those raiments were passed from high priest to high priest. The gem studded breastplate doesn't get remade each time. The epaulets are not refashioned. But when it comes to the clothing for Yom Kippur, that's a once-in-a-lifetime article of clothing. Like, like a bride's gown. You don't wear it a second time. In fact, when Yom Kippur came to an end, the Kohen would divest himself of those special, very beautiful, but austere white clothes and never put them on again. It's only on Yom Kippur that it's possible for somebody to experience the profoundest, most intimate moment of oneness with God in the Holy of Holies and only one person, the Kohen Gadol, and only when he's wearing those special white clothes. And this, my friends, is the point. Aaron was a man who burned with desire for spiritual intimacy, which is a dangerous business because if you get too close, there's no turning back. That's the tragic story of Nadav and Aviv rushing forward but could not remain tethered and Aaron yearned for this and because Aaron yearned for it as we learned yesterday Moshe Rabbeinu says Aaron don't try that same thing it's it's not healthy it's not good and Aaron yearned for that spiritual intimacy with God put yourself in Aaron's shoes Moses is talking to you before Pesach this is six months later you know there's going to be a special suit of clothing that's going to bring you to the zenith, to the apex of your spiritual possibilities. You, as a representative of the entire nation of Israel, will be entering the Holy of Holies with incense. You alone will experience that moment of intimacy. The thing you've yearned for, the thing you craved, it's got all the makings of a spiritual trip. It's got all the makings of spirituality that can be maybe even a little toxic sometimes because it's about it's the me factor i'm feeling spiritual i am experiencing this bliss this oneness with god but aaron was such a remarkable individual despite the fact that he his heart blazed intensely with this desire when it came time to doing what he was supposed to do it was never about aaron he may have been wearing the bride's clothes, but he behaved like a bridesmaid. He did simply what he was supposed to do. And if I may, I'd like to share I'd like to share a thought with all of you, my friends, a COVID nineteen thought that we can lift from this very beautiful tapestry of Torah teaching. There are many people some of them call themselves rabbis, 
who seem to be kissed by God these days. They have uh, all kinds of insight. Whatever personal hang-ups they've had in their religiosity or what they think might be the crusade of the day has suddenly attached itself to the current situation. They know why things are going wrong. They know how we can fix them. Other people have this messianic complex as they know exactly how Hashem is going to bring the curtain down on Galut. They know exactly what this is all about. I don't. I don't think they do either. If I may, I don't think any of us know what's going on. I don't think any of us really know why Hashem is doing what He's doing or what's going on in the world today. So people will say to you, well, well, then what should we do? And I would say, do as Aaron did. We know exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray every day without a quorum, without a minion, because that would compromise people's health, safety, and security. We're supposed to study Torah every day. And if we can't, in a class, in a Beit Medrash, together with others, on our own. We're supposed to care about others. And if we can't embrace or see them up close, then we use technology to stay in touch. We're supposed to try to uplift, inspire, and make other people feel better so that they too might be willing partners in making our world a better place. And so we use the wherewithal available to us. What does Hashem want from you and from me? He wants us to be better husbands and wives. He wants us to be betters, better siblings or children. Whoever you're quarantined or stuck with in this period of isolation, God wants you to be the best you that you can be. And I don't have to know why God is doing this. In fact, I don't have to know what tomorrow will bring to know what's expected of me today. Let's follow Aaron. The Mishnah says, Havemi Talmid of Aaron. Aaron is such an inspiring figure in Jewish history. He can even be your teacher. We can all become his disciples. Let's walk in his footsteps. Let's forget the personal spiritual trips. Let's forget the fake news insights. Let's focus on doing the right thing. And the right thing, the right thing is what is spelled out so clearly in the Code of Jewish Law and the Shulchan Aruch. All of us, each and every one, can improve in his or her Yiddishkeit. Let's just do it. And as for the future, the future, the future is something that we have to yearn for and hope for and anticipate every day of our lives. Physical separation, social, social isolation or not, the Rambam says that when it comes to Mashiach, the faithful Jew is the one who awaits Mashiach's coming every day. And if we await the coming of Mashiach, Isaiah says, God will do for those who wait, await, anticipate, and hope that any moment now our world will change for the very best, but the coming of Mashiach Bemheira will be a menu amen.